Despite exponential growth in the number of people testing positive for the coronavirus, a climbing death toll and pleas from public health officials for us all to be vigilant, not everyone is taking this pandemic as seriously as they're being urged to. Why isn't this sinking in for some, and what can be done about it? Let's ask. Peter Lowen, professor of political science at the University of Toronto. Amanda Galbraith, principal at Navigator. And Steve Yordens, who's a professor of psychology at the University of Toronto Scarborough campus. And it's great to welcome you all to TVO tonight for, um, I guess, um, we're trying out a new platform here. And God willing, it's all going to work out OK. You guys are our guinea pigs for this new way of doing television, which we're all figuring out uh, during the course of this pandemic. Let's get started here. Steve, how well do you think people are complying with the public health officials' admonitions at the moment? Well, I mean, I think we maybe, before we get into the bad news, which we're certainly going to talk about, focus on those people who are not complying, we should take a moment to realize how extreme a, a measure this is and sort of applaud the fact that for the most part, most of us have been willing to kind of go along with this stuff, even though it's a, you know, a big change in our life. And you know, to, to some extent, I'm impressed by how much um, we have gotten behind this. Uh, I think the, the numbers they throw are 80% are, are doing what we're supposed to be doing and 20% and are not. We're gonna focus on that 20%, I think, mostly today, but, but let's, let's applaud the 80% as a starting point, I think. Well, we can applaud the 80%, but 20% of a population of 14 and a half million people in this province still represents a lot of people. So Amanda, how well do you think we're following the rules so far? I, you know, I think it's good that we see people doing it. I do have real concerns. I was out on Sunday, for example, in Toronto. Like the minute the sun comes out, it seems everybody flocks to the one side of the road that has some sunlight and you can't social distance or take space um, to save your life. So I think, you know, where we see playgrounds being used, where we see people um, still going on play dates, and I know you really want to get out there, but the more we do this, the longer we're going to be here, which is why I think we saw the government um, yesterday really ratch up the language and I think we're going to see it you know become more serious and more serious as this pandemic really takes hold in our province. Yeah Peter I don't necessarily want to overdo it on the negative side of things but but what Amanda says is right every time the sun comes out here I mean we've got pictures from uh, the the beaches in Toronto where people just flocked when the sun came out and we're certainly not practicing social distancing you can see the beaches in Miami South Florida uh, quite packed people not taking any heed there whatsoever uh, the Grand Canyon as well, which they've now had to shut down. What's your sense of how well people are following the rules right now? Well, I think there's, there's two things to say about it. One is that we don't actually know very well how many people are complying with how many how many actions. Um, and we don't have a lot of good data on it. So lots of firms are collecting it now. But there's a lot of work to actually figure out how much compliance is actually happening. And the other thing I would say about it is that, you know, um, we're all trying to find a balance here. And it's nice to get out for a walk. Certainly on a sunny day, it's nice to enjoy some of those spring rays and it just feels good to be out to be outside. So I think we've got to um, recognize that, that, that the way we see things, the way we count things just isn't very accurate, you know? So when we go out and we walk around and we see people crowding, what percentage of people that represents? That's a really open question, right? And we're probably likely to over-represent the degree to which people are, people are violating. I think what's really gonna tell uh, on this and how well this is working is that it's taking people a little bit of time to figure this out and people are trying to figure out their routines and everything they're doing in their day-to-day -day life and how they're going to balance this for the next three four months as we get the, the signal that this is actually going to go on for a while so i think you know let's see what it looks like this weekend let's see what it looks like next week and let's see if people are kind of finally getting the message um, i think people understand for the most part that this is very serious and some people are a little slower adjusting in their lifestyle uh, than others but for the most part as, as steve said i mean this is a really impressive amount of social compliance that's occurring right now and i think that it's it's important that we focus on that as much as we focus on folks who are kind of violating what we think uh and what we're told we should be doing well steve i'll get you to follow up on that in in this regard uh, peter's quite right that we don't have any you know real deep dive hard data right now um you know that's incredibly reliable to indicate what percentage of people are following through on on the admonitions of public health officials but we all do have lots of anecdotal evidence and let me yeah. just pursue that for a second. Uh, do I hear right that, that you, you were out for a walk the other day and saw a group of 18 to 20 year olds and pick up the story if you would? 
Yeah, it's, it's almost the stereotype, but, but um, certainly the case. So it was another sunny day on the weekend. And, you know, as Amanda says, people are drawn by the sun. And, and from a mental health perspective, there's something to be said for that. Um, um, and on this particular day, people were trying to do the physical distancing. I won't call it social distancing, by the way, because I think that's the wrong term. They were trying to do the physical distancing. But then this one group of, I think, about four or five young people who obviously were not a family. They, they were obviously a group of friends we're kind of very chaotically walking around and coming very close to other people and it, it didn't really look blatant it looked maybe more ignorant than blatant um but but it was certainly the case that it was frightening people it, it was you know their disregard was striking and and yeah for for me especially and my wife it was like come on guys you know get with the program well teenagers already feel invulnerable so that that is certainly one of the one of the things at play like, here yeah, please go ahead. Sorry, if I, if I can, just, just one note on that. It is more of a challenge for them. Um, I, I mean, I, th I think we want to talk about how to convince them not to do this, but this social distancing that we're all feeling is especially hard on young people. Their lives are defined by their social networks and they're kind of creating these social networks and, and their friends are more important to them than anything. Um, people our age, we have friends, but you know, we can do without them for a while or, or do a phone call or something <laughs> like that. Um, so I think that's just something on the psychology side to keep in mind that this social distancing is not equally easy for everybody to pull off. Amanda, let me do a what if with you. Uh, what if one of your extended family members, for example, were not following the practices that we've been told to follow right now. What would you do about it? So that happened <laughs> uh, about a week and a bit ago. Um, a family member of mine was at a kind of a gathering with friends. Um, and, you know, it was tough, right? Because we're not, he's not immediate family, but I was really concerned because he lives with his dad who's older. Um, so I messaged him and said, hey, like, what are you doing? Um, this is the risks of this. Uh, understandably, you know, he's a server, right? They just got laid off. They'd all been working together, you know, in dangerous circumstances, if we can say that. Um, but it was tough. And, you know, I felt, I felt like it was my responsibility to say, this is why I'm worried. This is what you should know. I think part of this is as someone who consumes news all day long, part of my job is watching all these press conferences. I really feel like I am overwhelmed with data and information. And I think the average person maybe isn't quite as inundated. And I think the way we're communicating is challenging, but I think it's all of our jobs where you feel to reinforce with family members that you've got to do this. Like when my parents came back from being in Puerto Vallarta, I said to them, you've got to isolate. And my dad was going to go to work. And we had a serious conversation about it and they ended up staying home. And I think that's a big responsibility for all of us. Does a serious conversation mean a fight? <laughs> well, there was a little bit of a fight with one of them, but, uh, you know, when people's safety are involved, my mom's, um, doesn't have the best, like she's immunocompromised. Uh, I think that's an important part of being family is that I'd rather them be safe and us be in a fight than them be sick and not. And I think that's a real issue that families, um, and friends and colleagues are having across the country, right? Like my partner is an essential service. He goes to work every day. So we've had to take different steps in our home to manage that and it's tough. Hmm. I wouldn't necessarily say that the numbers I'm about to share with you are our, and our audience are deep dive numbers, but they are certainly initial impressions of where we are a few weeks into this thing. Uh, there was a Leger poll conducted a couple of weekends ago which showed that apparently 16% of respondents believed this crisis is partly blown out of proportion, 16%. Another 4% thought it was blown way out of proportion. And 21%, that's one in five people, thought it was having no impact on visits with friends and family. Two weekends ago, admittedly. Let's do another one here. Angus Reid did a survey this past Monday, and they found one in eight adults views the threat of a coronavirus outbreak as overblown. And finally, and I'm sorry to bring politics into this, but everything is political at the end of the day, apparently nearly two thirds 64% of those who say the crisis is overblown, they supported the Conservative Party in the last federal election. Okay, Peter Lowen, you're the poli sci guy. Come in here and make some sense of all this for us. Well, I want to start right off the top. I, I don't want to correct you, but I'm, but I'm going to. So to be sure, 64% of people who think the crisis is overblown are conservative. But the share of conservatives who think the crisis is overblown is 20% share of liberals who think it's overblown is is seven percent so the way to think about that is to ask what percentage of conservatives think it's overblown and it's one in five and now maybe that's maybe that's too many i think i think it probably is but there's not as stark a partisan difference here as those data were presented by by the angus reed institute and i think that's i think that's important to note 
you know, my 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 lab and, and a group of researchers at McGill have been have teamed up to study this. We, we're surveying a large number of people every week. You know, when we ask folks uh, whether they think that it is a serious, a very serious or somewhat serious crisis, I'm just looking at the numbers here. We have something like 94 percent of people say that this is something that they're very, very or somewhat concerned about. And that those numbers don't vary substantially across partisan groups. So I think people are getting the message. Uh, and the more updated data we've got, the better. But people are getting the message that this is a serious, a serious crisis. And just on the political front, to be sure about it, this is something where when you look at approval of the federal government's performance on this, look at approval of the prime minister, or you look at blame towards the prime minister, there's less partisan difference on this issue than any issue I've seen in the last 18 months. So this is something where there really is a pan-partisan consensus that this is serious, that people want the federal government to take and provincial governments to take action, and overwhelmingly, people are supportive of the actions being taken by both the federal government and by their respective provincial governments. So a bit like the social distancing thing, there's a lot more good news here about our country than there is bad news, I think. No, fair enough. And I didn't mean to suggest anything pejorative by saying that, that more conservatives than other groups uh, might have uh, a problem believing all this. But, uh, you know, as you think about it, and, you know, Peter, I'd, I'd really like to tap into your wisdom on this. That's not necessarily such a surprising thing. I mean, conservatives are generally, more than other politically minded people, uh, more skeptical of what governments can do, and, and many of them believe in a lot less government than more government. So we shouldn't necessarily be surprised or offended that more conservatives than other groups, um, you know, are, are having a tough time with this. Is that fair to say? Well, no, I think, it's, I think it's totally fair. I mean, conservatives are going to be more skeptical of what this government does, in particular the, the federal government, uh, which is of course a liberal government, than, than other voters. That's completely natural. It's as to be expected. And we see that. Um, I guess the good news in it is, is, that, is that the level of their skepticism and the level of their, of their criticism of the government is lower than it is on really any other issue. So I think they recognize that everyone's kind of pulling together here. Now, the other side of this, right, is that we want a good bit of skepticism, right? We want reasonable questioning of what government's doing. Government's asking a lot of people right now. You know, we're starting to signal that we're going to ask people to be in their homes until the end of July. That's an incredible sacrifice that people are being asked to make. It's having, it's having massive economic effects. So people can keep a balance here, you know, to watch carefully what government asks of them to comply as best they can. But it's the job of some politicians, obviously, to, to raise important questions at the, at the right times. I, I just think that on balance here, this is really an example of what reasonable politics looks like when people focus on big issues and figure out where they can agree and then figure out where they should disagree around the margins. So I think there's a lot of good news in this, to be sure. Okay, Steve, from, from a psychological perspective, what do you think is going on within this uh, hopefully smaller group of non-compliers as opposed to the vast majority of people who are content to go along. Yeah, so, so let's at least say there's at least two groups of non-compliers. There's the group that Amanda kind of talked about when the sun comes out and it's warm and they've been cooped up in their house, they just crave the outdoors and they're going to try to physically distance and all that kind of stuff. Um, but then there's this other group that seems to just not get it. Uh, and what's the story on them? So there's an interesting story from psychology, uh, a guy named Leon Festinger, who happened to notice this um, figure who was uh, predicting the end of the world. And she was very charismatic. Aliens were speaking to her and she was writing things down with her non-dominant hand. That was what the aliens were telling her. And one of the things they told her is the world was going to end on a certain day. Um, but of course, they were going to bring a spaceship down and save a select few, uh, the few that kind of believed her and followed her words. And she, she accumulated a following and they sold their possessions and they did everything like it was the end of the world. And Leon, being a clever psychologist, said, what are they going to do the day after? You know, when the world doesn't end. Uh, and so he kind of followed, kept tabs on this group. And the day after, when the world didn't end, he went to s talk to them. And, and basically, he was wondering, would they say, you know, I was an idiot. I can't believe I believe that. And the answer was no. Uh, they did not. Uh, they doubled down. Uh, of course, the person in connection with the aliens found a new date and, and a reason why. And they were very willing, with sort of a confirmation bias thing, once they've sort of, you know, in for a dime, um, they were very willing to now follow very odd bits of data to support what they continue to believe rather than having to believe that they did something really stupid. And mm -hmm. so if we go back, you know, two or three weeks ago, um, there was good reason to wonder whether, you know, shutting down the whole economy was too extreme of an act uh, to do on a countrywide scale, for example. Um, 
you know, over time, as we look at New York, that becomes a, a pretty obvious answer. But the people that dug in hard three weeks ago um, may have trouble coming to that new place. Um, they, they may hold that. So that's one of the things. It's something called cognitive dissonance. And it's one of the things that I think is at play here. Hmm. Amanda, I want to follow up on something you said earlier in our conversation, which is that you spend a great deal of time as part of your job essentially taking in the political briefings that the, uh, the, the Prime Minister, the Premier, and, and probably your old boss, John Tory, the Mayor of Toronto, uh, do on a daily basis. And I'd, I guess I want to start with this. Uh, how effective do you think these respective briefers are being in trying to get the message out, trying to convey the gravity of the situation, letting people know how they ought to change their behavior, that whole panoply of admonitions? I think the first few weeks, initially, I think it's been very good, right? The idea of having the Prime Minister, the Premier, the Mayor up at set times every day. I've talked to folks that are not in kind of the political world and they sort of set their watch by it. Um, they find it, you know, reassuring to see these, you know, these leaders come up and say the same thing every day. I would say we're getting into a bit of an area of diminishing returns at this point because I think these daily inundating people with these facts and data and in very complicated terms i think to a certain degree goes over folks heads i mean if you see in the uk for example they've actually hired back some of the folks that um originally did all the brexit communications like the get brexit done messaging because they're going to now shift their comms to treat it like a campaign and i think in canada as much as we want to adhere to our public health experts and we want to sort of defer to them which i think you've been seeing a lot in these avails um, or media availabilities. The problem is, is it's, it's highly technical. Um, what is social distancing? What is contact tracing? What are increased measures? That stuff means nothing to the average citizen. And I think we're going to need to she see these governments shift from this complex language to very plain, stay home, save lives, like that kind of thing, if it's going to keep working uh, as this heats up. Well, I thought we saw some of that yesterday. You know, the prime minister really in about as dramatic a tone as he's used so far, uh, looked into that camera and basically you know made a comparison to world war ii and said for this generation you have to do your duty stay home this is your duty you know john tory uh, using the same kind of expressions uh, made a comparison to the raptors you know we all came together to help get that win now let's get this win i mean that sounds like the kind of plain spoken language or i should ask you is that the kind of plain spoken language you think the times require Listen, I think it helps, and I noticed the tone change uh, as much as I think most of us did as well, is that, okay, they're getting more grave, this is getting more serious, but we're still talking in terms of we are contact tracing and there's increased measures and we have orders, um, they're talking about modeling, all that stuff, yes, they're, they're answers reporters want, but I think off the top it would behoove the governments to be very, like, they need to bring it down to an eighth grade level. You need to talk to people, sorry, that's my dog. Um, you need to talk to people uh, like you're speaking to uh, your grandmother or your kid, and I think that's where we have to get. Um, if you want people to stay in or be fined by $5,000, you have to just say it. Um, and I think we're going to see that increasingly as the governments, because we have these outliers, right? There's that 20%, that 10%. And as we've seen in other areas, one person going to something who's sick can cause 100 people to be sick. And we're going to see more and more of those cases in the coming weeks. Amanda, just uh, for what it's worth, yours is the third pet to have made a cameo ever since we moved <laughs> this program to my attic. So uh, don't feel bad about it at all. <laughs> this That's is the reality. I have a bag of treats next to me to throw at him during the show in case he uh, keeps going. <laughs> good. So. You came prepared. That's good to hear. Uh, Steve, let me ask you about sort of a tried, tested, and true political approach uh, that uh, really goes back to from time immemorial, and that is essentially uniting around a common enemy, in this case, a virus. Uh, how, how would you regard that as an attempt to unite the population right now? Yeah, no, no, it's, it's a big deal. And it comes from old studies of prejudice where they were successful in creating prejudice in people who didn't already have it. And then, of course, they had to figure out how do we eliminate this prejudice we created. And the key seemed to be getting these groups to work together to solve some problem that was relevant to them both. And so that's the common enemy. And it really can bring people together. Um, but it has to be communicated well. And if I could kind of take off where, where Amanda um, left off, um, with her sort of, you know, pitch to a, to a lower level. And I would also say pitch maybe to a different medium rather than rational thought. 
Uh, during the wartime, they had things like cartoons uh, where they would uh, depict various things. And I, I think it would be very powerful now to imagine a cartoon where there is this monster that's slowly growing um, with a medical community you know, sitting on the end, and they're the ones trying to fight this monster as it grows. And then all of us have this role of, of getting the food out of the way of the monster. Um, and we're just you know, trying to prevent it from growing by, by preventing the food. And then, of course, we have the people who aren't conforming who are bringing, dragging their relatives over to the monster to feed it. Um, you know, some image like that can be very powerful emotionally. And it can tell those people who aren't conforming, you know, that's you. You, you are those jerks feeding the monster, making it bigger, so that the healthcare community has to deal with what you're helping to create. And you know, stop being a jerk and come on our side. Get the food out of the monster's way. So you know, sometimes a very simple visual analogy like that can be more powerful than all the data you want. Peter, let me get your take on that from a political point of view. I mentioned already how Justin Trudeau was making analogies to World War II yesterday. Uh, we have heard Donald Trump uh, say from the Oval Office that he now considers himself a wartime president. Uh, what's your view of the value of making those kinds of analogies? Uh, I think. Uh, there's there's two things to say about it. One is that it's it's hard to convince people that you're in a war that that might be over in a month, and something that's going on here is it is it I, I I think Canada actually in comparison to other countries. So if you compare us to New Zealand, for example, the degree to which they've had real transparency around their models of what's going to happen with uh, with COVID in their population, we're doing two things at once. We've got governments asking us to be very serious and take really really quite serious measures and make quite serious changes to our lifestyles and to incur economic cost to take on this this challenge and then they're saying well you know we're going to keep the schools closed until until the beginning of may and then we'll see again so there's an alternative strategy which is just which is to really level and to say look at the you know as as it currently stands you're going to be in your homes until the end of july and we understand that that's an extreme sacrifice and you're having trouble and you're learning to be teachers with your kids and and it's hard on marriages and it's hard on work but this is the depth of the of the challenge you have to you have to square yourself up to i think there is a dis, this discordance between asking people to make big sacrifices and not leveling with them about how long they may have to make those sacrifices and i worry i really worry that if we do this step by step approach where we where we ask people to make sacrifices up to a certain point and then we renew and then we renew and then we renew without giving them a strong sense of how long this may go on. And at some point, the degree of public trust is just going to really start to fall away. Um, and the degree to which people are going to attend to those messages is really going to fall away. This is an unprecedented, unprecedented level of social coordination um, that's going on right now. And we shouldn't assume that it's going to last forever. And we should be really careful about, about figuring out what messaging and what things we can ask of people um, uh, that are going to sustain it for as long as possible. Hmm. Well, to that end, Amanda, do you think, for example, let's just take something that happened yesterday. Uh, the Minister of Education for the province of Ontario came out and said, schools closed now for another month. Uh, we have seen in other provinces, for example, I think Alberta and Manitoba, where they have just come out and said, the school year's over. We're not coming back to classes. That's it. Do you think the province of Ontario should have done that? I think realistically, given the fact that the City of Toronto has come out and said you, we're, there's no public events until July, I don't think anyone thinks school's going back in May. Um, I understand there's probably political considerations and just realistic, you know, they're following the recommendations of the medical officers of health. I get that's what they're doing. But from my perspective, I think the more upfront we can be with the public around how long this is going to last, the better we will prepare ourselves. And I, to, I agree to the point, we need to have trust in government, right? And with that comes transparency. Um, but we, the modeling they're doing, you know, the data, collecting it all, it's complicated. They're pulling it up from all of the different public health agencies, which are governed differently across the province. So there's real challenges on that end. Um, but I do think from a political perspective, they need to be more transparent. And I'm going to guess they're going to get there over the next week. And Steve, can you imagine... Um, if this does, well, look, at. let's just say it. We presume this is going to drag out for another many weeks. Eileen Davila, the medical officer of health for Toronto yesterday said, uh, you know, get re prepare to hunker down for the next 14 weeks or so. Where there's more of this to come. Do you anticipate a tougher job for our leaders convincing people to continue to self-quarantine as this moves in towards the summer months? 
I think, I think psychologically a couple of things will be important. Um, one is we will have to see, you know, as they're seeing in New York now that, oh, this was all for a good reason to begin with. You know, it is, it is hitting here. And if we get this feeling that's ramping up and ramping up and ramping up, then I think we're going to continue to feel like, okay, we have to continue doing our job. The other thing is some sense of control. Like everybody is really anxious now. And if I can very quickly mention, I've, I've got a free course on the Coursera platform about managing your anxiety during COVID. So I just wanted to throw that out for anybody who's feeling anxious. Um, but, um, you know, in, in this time of, of high anxiety, you need to have a sense of control. You need to feel like these things you're being asked to do are making a difference. That's a hard thing for governments to do because they don't have all the appropriate baselines. You know, we don't know what growth rates would be like if we hadn't done this. That's what we would love to know. And we would love to be able to say very clearly to people, hey, what you're doing is having a big difference and here's how much. Psychologically, that would kind of keep people in the game. But if they start feeling like more on a depression side, what we're doing is not making any difference. It doesn't matter. We're still all going to get COVID sooner or later. The healthcare system's still going to get overrun. Let's just let's just ride it out, as Donald Trump would say, I think a couple of days ago in a very dramatic way. Um, and, and so that's the worry. They need to see that what they're doing is having an impact. We've got just a few minutes to go here, and Peter, I don't necessarily want to throw you on a psychiatrist's couch right now, but I do happen to know that you just got back from Mexico not too long ago, which means that you've been, you and your family have been in self-isolation for, what, a few weeks now? And I, I guess I'm wondering, um, you know, how, how's everybody coping? Uh, so we got back just before we had to mandatorily quarantine. We, we chose to, uh, largely quarantine for, for 14 days. Uh, this is not the easiest thing I think we've ever done as a as a family. We spend a lot of time together, um, as it is. But I think the adjustment for a lot of people is like it has been like it has been for us. It's tough for kids who are used to being with their friends all day. I have a, I have a one and a half year old and a five year old to not be with their friends, and it's tough for them to be around their parents and not have their parents' attention. So if you're like us and you go to you go to an office for work, but you come home in the evenings and evening is family time kids feel like all day is family time. So, so you know, we're, uh, we're adjusting. Um, we're very fortunate, my wife and I, that we both have, both have jobs that are, that are still going and we've, we've got our salary, so we're very thankful for that. I think we're very conscious, conscious of that. Um, but, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about how we're gonna hunker down and how we're gonna make this thing work for the next um, three or four months. Yeah. And, uh, and we've really enjoyed the chance to reconnect with friends and to, and to spend time having Zoom dates with our, some of our friends in the evenings and, and to slow life down just a little bit. Um, but I think, you know, our families, like a lot of other families, this is a really, really tough time and we're figuring out how we're going to get through it. And we're just really hopeful that, you know, the people who are really kind of our friends who are doctors and are in hospitals doing the work, we're just really hopeful that they can really push this thing back um, and that we can, you know, not see the worst of it. Gotcha. I want to thank the three of you for coming on to TVO tonight and helping us out with this. Peter Lowen, Amanda Galbraith, Steve Jordans. Be safe, everybody, and uh, hopefully we'll do this again in the studio one of these days. Take care, everybody. You too, Steve. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.